I on? There I am. We're going to go ahead and, and get started uh, in the service tonight. We're going to talk about prayer for a little bit. How many of you know it's good to have uh, some power before we pray, right? And, and so it's good to look at God's Word and to see what God's Word says about prayer. Uh, I'm very excited for all the nights of prayer that we have because I believe this very much, that when the righteous pray, we make tremendous power available. Do you know anybody that needs some uh, power made available to them? Yes, yes amen. Uh, so I want to play this clip. It's about nine minutes, and uh, it, it's not a prayer uh, clip or anything, but how many of you watch Brother Joseph Morris and his end of days updates that he does weekly? So a lot of you don't, and you may not be familiar with it, but Joseph Morris has been here and ministered at our church several times, and he's actually going to be here in November uh, ministering as well. Um, and the Lord told him some time back that he wanted him to teach on end times. Uh, up until that time, Brother Joe very much talked about uh, the, the name of Jesus and the gifts of the Spirit. And, and I mean, uh, just walk, he still walks in, in the gifts of the Spirit and miracles. But his mandate from the Lord is, go teach my people that I'm coming back. So that's his mandate. Every single week, uh, he d gives an end of days report that he does. So, so we're just hitting some high levels here. This isn't a teaching. This is just some things that have happened over this past week. And uh, he talks about the things that are going on over in Israel. How many of you know that's what we're to be looking at? Is that right? Uh, the Word tells us. The word tells us that that is what we are, we are to be looking at. So I just wanted to play this, and then we are going to uh, get in and we're going to talk about prayer. And then uh, at the end of the service, my, just the direction that I feel like the Lord um, is saying for tonight, that we're going to pray for some lo our loved ones. And I know there must be people in this room who you have loved ones on your heart that you're praying for uh, to come into the kingdom. Anybody? Amen. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's our assignment tonight. Go ahead, Brad. Lord, aren't we blessed that the Bible gives us so much to show us right where we are? So that's what we're doing with the end of day's update. We're coming to you every week to look at what's happened around Israel that literally points to the coming of the Lord and, and also the, the gathering of the nations for the Ezekiel 38 war because we see that being a setup. Because the rapture is signless, but the second coming has tons of signs. I remember in our book, our new book that came out, uh, End Times Made Easy, I think there's 79 or 80 signs. We got some permission from Clarence Larkin to use his uh, graphs and his charts, so it's cool. You can glance at it and see where you are. So why, why would we want to know where we are? I hear people say, well, what will we, why do we need to know about the coming of the Lord? Well, you make changes. When you see the finish line, a runner doesn't slow down. He accelerates. It's all about an acceleration mentality. It's not a, a fear mentality. It's not an escape theology. It's, wow, there's the finish line. Jesus is just about to come. Even sinners right now see what's going on in the world and go, wow, something's up. I mean, to even have Columbia have to stop classes because of Palestinian protest against Israel, protesting for Hamas, University of Michigan, having Palestinian protesters have signs, death to America, uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, it goes on, NYU, all these young people protesting uh, against Israel. I like what one person said in Israel. It's just like Germany in 1938 with Hitler, everyone going after the Jews. Unbelievable. Let's pick up with what's happened, though, this last week. So many things are happening that are uh, uh, radical. You had yesterday or last night, uh, 40 different sites were hit by the Israeli Defense Forces inside of southern Lebanon. I mean, you got 40 different locations because the night before you had Hezbollah firing anti-tank missiles into northern Galilee. You had a couple of Israeli houses that were hit by those anti-tank missiles. And if you go south into Gaza, away from Hezbollah, you've got Hamas still firing rockets continually almost every single day. I think the, the number was 30 yesterday from one location. So it's intriguing that Hamas still keeps trying to harass Israel and keeps trying to do this. I love when Israel uh, 
retaliated against Iran and their precision strikes. They sent a message to Iran going, watch. They took out Iran's S-300 uh, air defense systems right by their nuclear plants. Israel was basically saying, we took out those right beside your plants. We could have taken out your nuclear plants as well, but we're showing you what we can do. And Israel's, uh, Iran's response was, we're going to annihilate Israel and we're going to annihilate America and we're going to impose Islam Shia law on the whole world. Well, I think they're, they're going to notice some uh, pushback on that. But you see all this escalating because why? Jesus is just about to come. And remember Amen. when Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, he said, hey, you can tell what the weather's going to be, but you don't know your hour of visitation. So Jesus wanted them to know. So we look at all these things that radically point to the second coming of the Lord. And it's a wake up call. You had North Korea this last week. They shot off uh, several uh, ballistic missiles that were to the south that were small, and then they shot off a, a massive uh, intercontinental ballistic missile, tested it with, with a, a, a basically the size of a warhead that could be a nuclear weapon. Along with that, you had the Iran being talked about their uranium that's enriched so far. I think Israel's going to have to do something really soon to take, take that away from Iran's arsenal. Also, you had uh, the UN's Antonio Guterres make a statement. The next disaster that comes forward, he should have the power to dictate what happens and what doesn't happen in response to all that. So it's wild you got these guys coming on the scene wanting to be one, one world leaders and one world rulers. You, you hear that from different locations uh, all over the earth. So you had t tons of earthquakes in Taiwan radical flooding in China. You had flooding so bad in Russia that they were concerned about uh, in, in, the enrichment, uranium enrichment getting flooded and, and contaminating everything. So you've got all these things pointing to the coming of the Lord, along with the different uh, asteroids that have been coming out. So one thing after another, along with Iran, boasting that they're going to wipe Israel off the map. But you watch, Israel's talking about going into Rafa so soon. Everybody's all mad at them about doing that, but they're going to have to do that. Because Israel's basically taken out 50% of Hezbollah's main leaders. I mean, that's with precision uh, strikes to take them out. So it, it's pretty wild to watch how flawless Israel can do this, and then the rest of the world gets mad at them. I talk about the attack that was last week, how Israel hit that one place where the two generals were, but right beside it on this side, right beside it on the other side, nothing was done. Listen to this. Some people came out from Al Jazeera saying that Hamas killed their own aid workers to make there be a food shortage so that they could t uh, uh, basically promote that the Gazans don't have any food. So it's just crazy stuff happening right now. So we always, after we go through all the things that are coming to pass to show us how close we are, we go back to the scripture because the scripture never changes. So number one, Israel made a nation in 1948. Number two, Jerusalem won back in 1967. Jesus said the generation sees those two events won't pass away to all fulfilled. But then you got the Hebrew language restored. You got the Ethiopian Jews brought back. You got the fertility of the land of Israel. You got the revival of the Roman Empire. You had foxes show up on the Temple Mount. You had fish show up in the Dead Sea. You had the Dead Sea turn blood red where Sodom and Gomorrah was last fall on the Day of Atonement. I mean, just absolutely amazing. 172 different species of predatory birds showing up in the land. So you've got a cleanup crew in Israel right now. I mean, after the end of the Ezekiel 38 war, God calls on the fowl of the air to clean the land up. After the battle of Armageddon, he calls on the fowl of the air to clean the land up again. So you have all these things. You've got men will be lovers themselves. We have selfie sticks. I think the, 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 all of them put together, it has to push us to say we're close. Ritual baths around the Temple Mount fill up with water. You had Russia rebuild the archway for Baal worship in Palmyra. That's where the Tower of Babel was. I mean, that's radical. The Talmud says that's the last sign you'll see before the Messiah comes. I mean, you had, you, you had Iran hitting Israel uh, uh, on, on Passover in the last couple of days. So just bizarre. Many, 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 many signs. You got into all of it. It's just it's overwhelming how, how cool it is to show us how close we are. Then you go from signs to signals. The Bible said the planets would be for signals for us. Psalm, Psalm says that the planets declare the glory of the Lord. And when we talk about the eclipses that were last week and seven years before that, amazing, the crossroads of America had happened exactly at three o'clock, the time that Jesus died on the cross. Many, many things that went along with that. But you, you, had, uh, you had blood red moons a few years ago on Passover and Tabernacles. Four in a row, NASA calls that a tetrad. When's the last time you had four in a row on Passover and Tabernacles? 1948 when Israel's made a nation. 1967 when Jerusalem was won back. 1492 at the Edict of Expulsion when the Jews were kicked out of Spain. Uh, remarkable. 
those things happening on dates tied with Israel. So why do we get into all this? I said about acceleration. He loves you. He wants to bless you. He's not mad at you. He wants you to know this stuff because this is a big deal. God's about to come to the planet. He came the first time, was beaten and killed, died. God raised him from the dead. This time he's coming back in glory. Wow. You had the Bethlehem star. You had so much that went with that. Jupiter, Regulus, and Venus all happening at the birth of Jesus. Constellation was Virgo. This last year, the constellation was Leo. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The earth making preparation. And most of it doesn't even realize that the entrance of the king is about to happen. We in the church, what do we do? Help our local church, help our local pastor, do whatever we can to be engaged. This is a time to not fit church into your life. It is our life. Why? You're about to see the king. Wow, think about what you're going to say or do right there when we see the author of life, the creator of heaven and earth and everything that is, the, the, the glorious one, the righteous branch, the everlasting father, the beginning and the end, the shepherd and the bishop of your souls, Jesus of Nazareth coming so soon. Have a blessed week. We'll come back and see what Israel's done. They probably have gone into Rafa, probably had to hit some targets in Damascus. We'll see what Russia's done about the Ukraine getting more aid. That aid package was passed for Israel and the Ukraine. Uh, radical Bible days are here. Jesus is just about to come. Have a blessed week. We'll see you next Wednesday. Amen. It's, it's pretty important that we as God's people know the time in which we're living. Amen. We've heard so many from, our, uh, from ministers, uh, just from people of faith, um, and the declarations that have been spoken uh, about this year. And, and things that we hear over and over and over and over is about to make sure that we're not distracted. To cut out the distractions. To cut out the distractions. Now, now here's the thing. We, we should all be smiling and we should all be very excited that our Lord and Savior is about to uh, come back to the earth. And I love what Brother Joe says. And, and he always says, if you've heard end time teaching that scares you, uh, then you heard wrong teaching. Amen. If you've heard end time teaching that causes you fear, then we have heard the wrong thing. And he, he says this all the time, that yes, it's going to get darker and darker in the world, and it's bad news for the world, but there is no bad news for the church. Amen. There's no bad news for the church. Our path grows brighter and brighter. Amen. Amen. But do you believe that we should be about uh, eternity business uh, in this day and in this hour? So it's super, uh, it's super good for us to, to listen. Uh, like I said, those were just high-level things. That was not a teaching where he breaks it down in Scripture and he shows us things. That's just uh, an update that he does every single week to, uh, to let us know what is going on over there. And I'm sure that you all know this, that you cannot understand and know what's going on in Israel by watching our media. Amen. Amen. So, anyway, I wanted to share that uh, as we just talk about prayer tonight. And uh, it's going to be a good night. Amen. Amen. How many of you guys have heard uh, this statement? Uh, and, and if you've heard, if you've been here for any time and where we've talked about prayer, where we, where we prayed together, I'm not going to say anything. Y'all aren't going to hear anything that you haven't heard uh, before. Uh, but it certainly is. It's God's word, and it's good for us to be stirred and to just keep us on the path. Amen? Amen. So this statement that we've heard for a lot of years, we pray there before we go there. We pray there before we go there. Uh, and so it, it's good to know that because there's places that God wants us to go, but our voices and, uh, and our prayer is required for us to walk in them. Amen. So prayer should be the steering wheel of our lives. This is so true. Prayer, just in our own personal lives, it... Um, well, it should be the steering wheel of our lives and not the emergency airbag, right? Amen. It's just, it's our daily fellowship with the Lord. It is, it's just our, our daily, I, I was listening to how many of you are familiar with uh, Brother Jerry Savelle. And you know that he stepped into glory uh, last week. And I was listening to one of his, one of his messages and um, 
actually I think it was his daughter interviewing him, but, but just talking about prayer and, and a question was posed to him about how much do you pray, when do you pray, and, and, uh, and that, which is often a, a question that people want to ask ministers, you know. And, and he said, prayer is just, he said, it's just my walk with the Lord. He said, I don't ever, I don't ever leave it. It just in constant communication uh, with my Lord and Savior. And how many of you know when we exit this earth, it's not the end. It is the beginning. Yeah. Amen. We, we are being trained here on earth for what we are to walk in throughout eternity. Ruling and reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so uh, truly... For, for a Christian, it really is just a matter of slipping, excuse me for the spit, uh, just slipping out of our natural, of this natural body, but continuing right on into uh, eternal life. Amen. Stepping over into glory. Amen. Thank you for that enthusiasm. All right. Regarding prayer, John Wesley, he says this. He said, it seems God is limited by our prayer life that he can do nothing for humanity unless someone asks him. That's absolutely right. Amen. God has a forever determined that he is partnering with man because he turned authority over to man when he created him and put him on the earth. The authority in the earth he gave to man. Amen. Martin Luther said, prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, but laying hold of his willingness. Amen. So, man, when, when God's people turn the corner in, in this area, um, you know, as, as, as God's children, we should not be those who pray such down under uh, begging type prayers. Like we're just trying to pull something out of God's hand. Amen. But when we don't know, when we don't know what his word says, uh, when we don't know his character, and he tells us his character in his word, right? But when we, when we don't know that, uh, then, we, then our prayer life and our relationship with him is just from down under. We're just little peons down here just praying and begging that the Almighty One would do something for us. And never ever knowing uh, when he will and when he won't. Boy, that's a miserable place to live. And it's certainly contrary to God's word. Aren't you glad that God's word tells us something entirely different? Amen. Thomas Kincaid said this. He said, the power of prayer is like turning on a light. Interesting, since he was the painter of light, right? As it illuminates God's purpose for our lives. There is no greater connection to knowing his will other than his word. Amen. So if we want to know the will of God, we must go to the word of God. His word is his will. Amen. So we don't have to wonder. We don't have to stay in a place of confusion because everything in our lives, every every temporal fact in our lives has an eternal truth that, w- that is available to us as God's people. I am spitting everywhere. Anybody want to come sit up front? <laughs> there is uh, an eternal word, an eternal truth to lay on every temporal fact in our lives. Amen. Amen. All right, so a foundation scripture. Let's go to James 5.16. And man, this is one that we talk about that just very frequently. And it it truly is a a foundational scripture for, uh, for prayer. But it says this, the last part of it. It says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. I love that so much because, number one, it tells me I'm not a victim. Amen. I, I, I don't have to live with the victim mentality and I don't have to look at others uh, like they're victims because there's an answer. 
because there's great power that can be made available in our lives and great power that can be avail- made available to other people's lives. Amen. And it takes the victim mentality right out of us. Amen. Uh, the, the amplified version says the heartfelt and persistent prayer, another amplified, persistent prayer of a righteous man, a believer, can accomplish much when put into action. Amen. So we know that there's a God part and there's a man's part. Right? For, for his workings in the earth, there's, a, there's God's part and there's man's part. And we want to not be distracted we don't want to be distracted in this day and, and in this hour uh, because we want to make sure that we're doing our part, that we're walking in the fullness of all that God has called us to walk in, that our feet be planted on that preordained path that he has created for each of us to walk in. Ephesians 2.10, I mean, we, we see the finish line and uh, we are running strong. And this I know about God, there's nothing in God that lessens there's nothing in God that grows dimmer amen amen so our path grows brighter and brighter our strength grows stronger and stronger we're not um we're not just at the the world's um the world's and and the enemy's uh what's the word I'm trying to think of huh yeah, that's good. At, at, their, at the world's or the enemy's mercy uh, to just take what, whatever is happening. Amen. Amen. So, so when he said this is not the time to draw back, uh, what are we to do? Uh, we're to help our local church. We're to help our pastor. Uh, we don't fit church into our life. Church is our life. So we need to keep uh, we need to keep ourselves stirred up in the faith, and we need to be about stirring and strengthening others up, so that we're running our race in strength and not weakness. And and we're going to run in weakness if our eyes are on anything going on in the world. Amen. Instead of having our our eyes lifted up where our help comes from. Amen. Man, I'm determined. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just determined. I'm not exiting this earth in weakness. I'm not exiting this earth in defeat. Amen. Uh, the price that Jesus paid, the blood that he shed to eradicate the sin of mankind is enough to put us over, not just by the skin of our teeth, but victoriously in this day and in this hour. If the world doesn't see anything, anything different than what they got, how on earth will they call upon the one who can save them? Amen. We should look extremely different. We should be a bright light. Amen. Our lives full of light. Thank you, Lord. The earnest prayer, this is in the NLT. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Glory to God. What a great scripture to have in your mouth. When I pray, I make tremendous power available to others. One, one of uh, a great testimony with Landon in court. And Landon referred to this uh, when, um, with Hart's accident a few years back. But he said, and court did too, he, they could physically, spiritually, and in every way uh, experience and feel that power being made available to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And you know why? Because there were people who, well, number one, their own words paved a way. But number two, uh, because there were people who prayed according to God's word and not out of fear. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. So I want to read... Uh, I want to read just two pages out of this book. This is something that I have read before, but it goes right along with uh, the video that, that we just watched. 
but uh, continued and persistent prayer. And I believe this comes from a revelation of a couple of things. Continued and persistent. And that is us growing and developing in who we are in Christ Jesus. This is, a, this is a lifelong journey that we should be giving our attention to every single day. Knowing who we are and growing in who we are. The more we grow, uh, the more impact we're going to have. How, how many of you know that, that grown people uh, can do more than little babies? Right? Little babies are precious, and we're believing for whole families to be swept in, in, into the kingdom. Uh, but we need some grown-ups in the body of Christ. Those who have grown and developed and know who they are in Christ Jesus. So when they pray, uh, when they pray, they, they make tremendous power available. Amen. Amen. So who we are in Christ and then... Then this is just huge, living our lives uh, with an eternal perspective. Amen. Living our lives for eternity and not just for these few years uh, that we are here. Amen. Y'all out there? Okay. Here. All right. So two, two pages here. It says, for four years, my, this was written by uh, Patsy Caminetti for such a time as this. She said, for four years, my husband Tony and our daughters Liliana and Annalisa and I lived on the island of Singapore. Occasionally, we took a cable car to a smaller island called Sentosa. The cable car travels along a strong cable, which is securely fastened above the ground between two grand towers, one on Singapore and the other on Sentosa. This scene illustrates something of eternal significance for me. There are two major events on God's calendar which give Christians purpose and direction for their lives. One is the first coming of Jesus. The other is his second coming. When we accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, our lives pictured by the cable are lifted up from the ground and fastened into the first tower, the first coming of Jesus, the redemptive work for which he came. Hallelujah. But without the second tower representing the second coming to attach to, the cable of our lives begins to go downward and we will only live for the here and now. God's purpose for each of us will be lost and we will not reach our destiny. If we are ever to fully accomplish our God-given destiny, then our lives must be suspended between these two towers these two towering events, Jesus' first and his second coming. The purpose of our lives must be fastened and suspended between a consciousness of these two events. May the Lord open our eyes to see and live in the awareness that Jesus not only came, but Jesus is coming again. Amen. Hallelujah. So, so Father, I thank you. I thank you for an eternal perspective. I thank you that your word says that you have uh, set eternity in the hearts of men. And so we say it is so in this people and in this house um, that uh, an eternity perspective. And where, wherever we have been distracted and wherever we have um, just um, dropped the ball, so to speak, Father, I thank you that just a, just a new vision and just a new stirring in all of our hearts that we truly live between those two towers, that you not only came, but that you're coming again. I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So when we pray, let's go to Ephesians 2, 6. When we pray, it's vitally important that we pray from the proper platform. Again, just like I said a while ago, that uh, it's important that we don't pray down under. That we don't pray begging prayers. And religion does make beggars out of God's people. So we want to know what God says and what truly our position in Christ is so that we're praying from a place of strength and authority and dominion and not from down under. Amen. So Ephesians 2.6 uh, in the Amplified, obviously, if you know me, you know I would love to read Ephesians 1 and 2 all together. But for time's sake, we're going to look at Ephesians 2.6. And he says this, and he raised us up together 
with him and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere in Christ Jesus, the anointed one. He raised us up together with him and made us sit down together. Glory to God. And so we live our lives knowing that we were crucified with Christ, we were buried with Christ, and we were raised with Christ. And uh, someone in our, in our um, small group, yeah, it was Jason, I think, talking about perspective, right? And so it matters. Uh, you know, things look really different standing up here than it does standing down here. And so our perspective, when we take our seat uh, every, every single day, we take our seat of authority and dominion in Christ according to the Word. I'm not making this up. Are y'all looking at your Bible? I want you to look at your Bible. I don't want you to just listen to my voice. I want you to look at your Word. Amen. And, and so when we do this, when we take our position in him because I see things differently. I see myself as a victor. I see myself as overcoming. Amen. I see things that I don't see from down here. And when I pray, I pray with authority and I pray with power instead of a down under uh, victim type prayer. Amen. Amen. All right. So we cannot pray a prayer of faith from a place of down under. And faith prayers are the only prayers that get answers. Amen. Amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Romans 10, 17. Uh, so some scriptures, some scriptures that have helped me in terms of praying the prayer petition or needs in my life. Let's look at 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <laughs> and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So this is praying uh, the prayer of petition, or we're coming to him specifically asking him or requesting something from him. And, and here's the problem because it says this is the confidence that we have in him. If we pray anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. Here's where we get tripped up because so many Christians are living not knowing what his will is. And, and so God never meant for prayer to be just a shot in the dark. Just throwing it up and just with this mentality of you never know what God's going to do. And, and I'm telling you, God's will for one person as far as redemption and our inheritance is concerned, his will for one is his will for all. Amen. Amen. And so we don't want, we don't want to settle to be people uh, that, that we're just okay with not knowing what his will is. Because everything that we face in life, there is a promise, a truth in his word to answer whatever it is we're facing. Amen. Thank you, Lord, is right. Amen. So we don't want to settle. We don't want to be a people that's just okay with not knowing and just <clears throat> living our lives. And, you know, whatever will be, will be. It's all up to God, you know. And, uh, okay, sirrah, sirrah, right. Amen. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Amen. So God never meant for prayer to be a shot in the dark. I am so thankful. Oh, you! I am so thankful for that. I am so thankful that I know that when I lift his word up to him and when I pray his word that he's watching over that word to perform it. I don't have to wonder. I don't have to wonder. I can base my life on it. Amen. I can base my children's lives on it. Amen. So there's a myth uh, and I used to hear this all the time, and sometimes God says yes, and sometimes God says no, and sometimes God says maybe, and it makes me want to puke. 
but because uh, that that just goes along with it. It sounds really humble, and it sounds really religious, and it sounds really right. Give me scripture. Give me a scripture for it. Yeah, there's no scripture for it because it just said, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, then we have the desire, the petition that we've asked. Amen. It doesn't say, well, sometimes I'm going to say yes, and sometimes I'm going to say no. So what, what's the thing that we need to know? His will. His will. And like I said, there, his, his, this word is full of what his will is for us. His word is full <laughs> of promises for us. Amen. That is some th- <laughs> some th- some thunderous quietness. Thank you, Lord. Let's turn to Jeremiah one. Jeremiah one. Mm. Let's see, Isaiah, Jeremiah. I usually have uh, it typed out in my notes, but I actually don't. And I really like that because I don't know if um, what y'all's Bible looks like. Um, but this is what mine does, looks like. So I mark, I mark it up really good. And there's times that I don't know the reference, but I know, what pa- I know what side of the page it's on. And I know I can get close to it, you know. And uh, there's just, there's nothing like. I'm telling you, I'm going to say this. Y'all can throw it away if you want to, but I, I'm going to say it. There's nothing like holding his word and reading his word. And I'm just saying the electronic device, um, I, I'm, I'm thankful that, that we have it, but it doesn't compare to holding his word in our hands. And this is my conviction. Do I, do I talk conviction or do I talk his word? Well, I'm going to say my conviction here. Y'all can throw it away if you want to. But this thing right here, Hello, I just turned the light on. Sorry about that, Landon. Sorry about that. Oh, it's still on. Jesus, take the wheel. Okay, there we go. So obviously you need to know how to work it. Um, But we do a lot on this. We do a lot on this. I said we do a lot on this. And, And when I lump in my time with the Lord with this device right here, uh, to me, it's not something that's set apart. It's just something that I lump in uh, to the rest of my life. You know what I'm saying? So don't go out and say, Mona said we can't read on our phone. I didn't say that. I, I just said as th- there's something precious about holding the Bible in our hands. All right. So, Jeremiah 1, we're going to start in verse 9 for this. said, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Say words. Words. God's words in my mouth. See, I have this day appointed you to oversight of the nations and of the kingdoms, to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch or a shoot of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. Amen. What is, what is God alert and active and watching over? What is the only thing that God can perform in the earth? Amen. So the more that we put the word in us and the more, and it said that, uh, he, he told Jeremiah that I put my words in your mouth. Words and mouth. I put my words in your mouth. And through my words in your mouth, you have the ability to root out things in the spirit realm that ought not to be there. Amen. You have uh, <clears throat> the ability to build and to plant through God's words in our mouths. Amen. 
Amen. So he's watching over his word to perform it. I tell you what, when I heard these scriptures uh, for the first time, the ones in, in 1 John, these scriptures, I thought, oh my, the power at our disposal. And I don't want to do anything but find God's words. I want God's words. That's all I want. I want God's words. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> So the word of God is the fuel for our praying. When we are praying Hail Mary prayers and stumbling in our prayer lives, we need to check our word level. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. So that's right, Mona. That's right. That is good preaching. Good preaching. Bring it on. Okay. Amen. Amen. So when we're praying Hail Mary prayers, when we're stumbling in our prayer lives, a red flag should go up and, and alert us that our word level has come down. Right? All right. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to move to, uh, let's go to Isaiah chapter 40, please. Isaiah chapter 40, we're going to start in verse 3 there. And uh, it says, A voice of one who cries, Prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Who was that in the New Testament? Who is, who, who's he talking about? That's right. John the Baptist is who uh, Isaiah is prophesying about. A voice of one who cries, prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Clear away the obstacles. What is uh, a wilderness? It's undeveloped places. Uh, a wilderness is undeveloped places. And so I ask you, is there an undeveloped place in your life? Is there an undeveloped place in your family? Is there an undeveloped place in our community, in our schools? Thank you. A voice of one who cries, prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Clear away the obstacles. Make straight and smooth in the desert a highway for our God. We're talking about words. We're talking about prayer. Every valley shall be lifted and filled up, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked and the uneven shall be made straight and level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory, the majesty, and splendor of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Glory to God. A voice says, cry, prophesy. And I said, what shall I cry? The voice answered, proclaim. All flesh is as frail as grass and all that makes it attractive. It's kindness, it's goodwill, it's mercy from God. It's glory and comeliness, however good, is transitory. Like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades when the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely all the people are like grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. Say it with me. But the word of our God will stand forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So God gives us words. Uh, we're talking about our mouth and we're talking about words that we pray and words that we declare. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth one day. But the Bible tells us over and over that God's word will stand forever. I'm going to go back and I'm going to say this. For every fact, for every tem everything in this natural realm is temporal. Is that right? Yes. It's temporal. Everything in this natural realm is temporal. And so, so we call those things facts in our life. We don't deny that every one of us face facts. But there is an eternal truth in God's word that trumps every fact in our lives. And so we can say, we don't have to act like that we're not going through something. We state what we're facing, but then we follow it up with truth. Amen. Amen. The importance, the importance of God's word when we're praying. And that will get us off of our knees of begging for God to do something in our lives and in our family's lives. Amen. 
<clears throat> okay. Let me go back to Jeremiah here and let me see if I want to hit anything more before we move on. No, no, that's good. I would read Jeremiah, though, Jeremiah 1. Mark that down as your, as your homework. <laughs> so we pray there before we go there. And just reading in, in what we read in Isaiah there, uh, no praying, no glory. Come on. So, so we're not waiting on the Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, he, we just need to hook up with him. We just need to hook up with him. We're not waiting on him to move. You know, it, it, <clears throat> I don't like it. I just don't like getting together and hearing people beg, Oh God, oh God, we need you. Oh God, we desperately need you. Just move, just move in this hour. Just move. God's already moved. God's already moved. Come on, people. Come on, brothers and sisters in Christ. God has already moved. He's already recreated us in Christ Jesus. He's put his spirit on the inside of us. He's given us his eternal word that never fails, that he watches over to perform. We don't need to be begging him to move. We need to hook up with faith in what he's already done. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So, we're going to close uh, tonight with this. And that is praying uh, for loved one's salvation. So, there's been a word that's been declared uh, by the Spirit of the Lord uh, in this house and to this people. And that is whole families being swept into the kingdom. Amen. Whole families. Say whole families. Whole family swept into the kingdom. This is, a, this is a good phrase to have in our mouth and to thank God for. Father, we thank you that whole families are being swept in to your kingdom. That includes my family and that includes other people's families. Amen. And uh, let's see, over the weekend we had 60 salvation, uh, 63 Philip took him to the airport, said he prayed with three more he, uh, at the airport, so 63. Amen. Was there more added uh, this week? I mean, we're, we just get testimonies and testimonies and testimonies and testimonies uh, of people receiving Jesus. Let me give you, let me give you one uh, right here. And that is Miss Janice has been praying for her sister who is, I'm not sure, mid to late 70s. But uh, she's been standing on the word that me and my household shall be saved. Hallelujah. And just trusting God. Trusting God for her salvation. Well, she actually came in to be here with Janice uh, as Janice had surgery last week. And um, she actually, she was staying with Miss Janice in the hospital. She tripped on something. Her sister actually fell, hit her head, ended up in ICU with a brain bleed. And... Um, and so we, just in praying, we just had the sense that the real reason that she was here was to receive Jesus, to be born, to be born again. And uh, she asked Miss Janice a question. She said, Janice, if I die, am I going to see mother? Am I going to see uh, her sister? And she just lost a little dog. You know, will I see the, the little dog again? Well, the door was wide open, so it wasn't at that time. But yesterday I got a call from Janice, who couldn't hardly talk for, for laughing and crying, but she led her sister to the Lord. Yes. Glory to God. <laughs> glory, glory to God. On that same day, uh, we get a text in, in our uh, family thread or, or some thread uh, that our six-year-old grandson, Leland, prayed with the child at school to receive Jesus into his heart. I know, and you know that, so, that sounds so precious, and you just go, oh, oh my goodness, there is no junior Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit in, in us is in him. 
Amen. So, so people are so open. The harvest is so ripe. Amen. And, and whole families being swept in. Whole families being swept in uh, to the kingdom. And you know what? We have to know this. We have to know what God says, what God's will is. All right? And it, we don't have to wonder about God's will regarding our loved ones. 1 Timothy 2.4 says, Who desires, talking about God, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. This is God's will for every single person. So if you've ever believed or if you've ever heard that God saves some and not others, it's a lie from the pit of hell. God's will is that all be saved and come to the knowledge of him. We, we cannot make Jesus other people's Lord. Every person <clears throat> that comes on us, right, Every, every person makes that personal decision, but God's will is for all to be saved. So we've got huge praying material right there. We don't have to ask God to save someone. You know, when we pray prayers like that, God, I just pray. I just pray that you would save them. What do, what, what do we expect God to do? To send Jesus to be crucified again? You know what I'm saying? So we, so we don't ask God to, to save someone again. We're believing <clears throat> for them to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The Lord told uh, Sister Jeannie Wilkerson, uh, this is uh, something that I've just I heard some years ago and it blessed me so. She said, any loved one's name that you bring up to the Father, he will apprehend them. If need be, he will wrestle them in the night to get them ready for eternity. Thank you, Lord, is right. Thank you, Lord, is right. And, and I'm going to say this right here. Uh, I just felt that, that the Spirit of God say this today. And so I'm going to give this instruction. And that is you need to get your worry off of your family. Because it's your, wor your worry that is the very thing that is hindering them. There's no faith that flows from worry. There, there's no faith whatsoever. So you need to get your worry and your concern off of your family. And you need to say what God says about your family. Amen. We need faith. We need light going to our families. And our worry and our concern, and I don't care if you're a champion warrior, I'm going to tell you this, worrying does not make you a good parent. Amen. It does not make you a good parent. In fact, uh, let's just turn there. This is not part of my notes, but thank you, Lord, you're helping us. John, this was in our reading uh, this week. John 14 and, and verse 1. It says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, distressed, agitated. This is a command. This is what I wrote in my Bible. This is a command. Therefore, circumstances don't dictate the obedience of this. My will does. My will does. Do not, Mona, do not let your heart be troubled, distressed, or agitated. You believe uh, in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is saying this. And then he says the same thing in um, verse 27. And he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed. And do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. Isn't that interesting? The, the first part of that scripture says, peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you and then he says do not let your hearts be troubled so that is a command and that is an instruction and when we disobey that or or when we worry when we allow ourselves to be agitated we are in disobedience amen amen so the so the best thing as someone who loves their family the best thing that we can do is get our worry off of them and get our concern off of them. 
and start saying what God says and start praying God-sized prayers, amen, so faith and light is made available to them instead of doom and destruction. Amen. Amen. And, and I was reminded, we're going to pray, actually, uh, for our loved ones. Uh, but just in, in thinking about praying um, praying for our loved ones, even, you know, even if it's not blood, we have loved ones we work with, you know, and, and, or, or acquaintances or uh, whatever. Uh, but just in praying, praying for um, those, those around us. And I was reminded something that I have done for so many years with absolute belief and confidence that the blood is enough. That the blood of Jesus is enough. And I think about Rahab, the story of Rahab, when the spies uh, went in to, uh, to Jericho, you know, and getting ready to take the land. And remember that Rahab uh, hid the spies in her house. Do you remember that? And, and she said, even she was not a covenant woman, and yet she feared Israel's God. There was a reverential fear in the God of Israel. And she asked the spies, she said, I'm asking you, since I have done this for you, uh, that you would spare me, that, that you would spare my family when you come in, because we know you're coming in, and we know that you're taking the city. Amen. And uh, the spies gave her, uh, you know, this was just right after the Passover, right, right after, you know, they had observed the Passover, the Passover lamb, but they gave gave her a scarlet thread. Y'all remember this? A scarlet thread to hang in her window. Now, was that scarlet thread going to protect her, her family or, you know? No, but it was faith. What was it faith in? It was faith in the blood of Jesus. The faith in the blood that was yet to be shed. <laughs> Amen. And, and so this, this is what she said, though. And, uh, and the spies said that they... They gave her the scarlet thread to hang in her window, uh, but she said, not for me alone. I want my family. I want my father. I want my mother. I want my brothers, and I want my sisters, and I want all of our possessions. The, the, this sounds like uh, the Passover uh, in Egypt when, when, when the death angel came over and, and God's people were hidden in the house with blood over their doorpost. Is that right? And no destruction came, came to them whatsoever. But, but Rahab, a non-covenant woman at the time, through faith and the fear of Almighty God, preserved not only herself, but her family and all of their possessions. And I believe it was because of her faith and obedience in, in hanging that scarlet uh, thread in her window, faith in the blood. Faith in the blood of Jesus. Faith in the blood of Jesus. I apply the blood of Jesus over my family. And I believe with all my heart, and I thank you, Father, that the same blood, the blood that saved us, the blood that redeemed us, that, that saved us from our sin and eternal death is the same blood that will keep us all the days of our lives and all throughout eternity. And so any loved one that I pray for, anybody that I pray for for salvation, I apply the blood of Jesus to their lives. The blood speaks a better word. Amen. The blood speaks a better word. And when we're praying and when we're believing uh, for people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, you, we, we've talked about words for so long, you guys. We, we can't just uh, spit out uh, unbelieving, unbelieving words. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? We, we can't be in our prayer closet and pray a great prayer of faith and, and uh, declare God's word over somebody and then talk about them uh, like they're still going in the same direction, like there really isn't any hope, that you're just disgusted with them. Do you understand? We have to hold to the word of God and believe that his word is true no matter what we see. No matter what we see, and we hold on to it. 
Thank you, Lord. I'm going to go back to Miss Janice. She prayed for her husband for, help me, Becky, 40, 30, 40 years. 30, 40 years. And he gloriously gave his life to the Lord because that wave drew. Because that little boy right there, who's not so little now, but he was little at the time, said, Grandma, I don't want Grandpa to go to hell. I want him to know Jesus. And he crawled up in bed with him and led his grandpa to the Lord. I'm telling you, God is faithful. God is faithful. If, if we will say what he says, if we will, as Jeannie Wilkerson said, uh, call the names of our loved ones before the throne of God, uh, God says, I will get their attention. Hallelujah. And he's faithful to send people, laborers across uh, people's paths. Amen. Amen. Faithful to do it. Faithful to do it. Amen. And, and here's the thing. When we're praying for someone, for God to send someone across our loved one's paths, how many of you know it's important that we be sent ones? That, that we also are, are ones that are sent across people's path to bring them the good news. Amen? Amen. Well, were you encouraged tonight? All right, stand with me and we're going to pray. Do you want to share something before we pray? Yeah, you can go ahead and stand still. Um, hey, can you put, Brad, can you put Isaiah 40 back up? Before we pray, I want to I wanna reemphasize something that I think, I believe is very, very important why she went over this tonight. So Isaiah's prophesying about John the Baptist like we were talking about. I want you to, as we read this, I want us to think about what piece of equipment would do something like this. Preparing the wilderness a way of the Lord. Do, can you... Do you have like the New King James or something? That's what I was reading, sorry. But I want you to think about what piece of equipment is going to do what we're talking about right here, and this is how we need to be in the Spirit, okay? Because a lot of times when we pray and we don't know the will of God, what we're doing is we're, we're just rambling, and I'll just go ahead and give it away as you, as you read it. We'll just, let's just go. Prepare in the wilderness the way of the Lord. Clear the obstacles. Make straight in the desert, a highway for our God. <clears throat> Verse 4, every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low, the crooked places made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed. What, type, what piece of equipment can do this type of stuff? A bulldozer. We're to be spiritual bulldozers because it can do all of this stuff right here. And it reminds me of, you know, typically when you're seeing someone work a bulldozer, you see someone in the bulldozer, they get, are they getting stuff done? Something's happening when they're on the bulldozer. Things are moving. They're shaping something. Something's going on. And typically you'll see a lot of people standing around, either telling them what to do or just standing around leaning on a shovel. Am I right? And those are like the people who, they, they're saying a lot of things, but not nearly, not much is happening. What if, what if all five of those workers had big bulldozers and they were all getting after it? What could be done then? This is the importance of knowing the will of God and praying out the will of God because we are spiritual bulldozers. This is, this is who we're supposed to be. That, that is what we're supposed to be doing in prayer. We're not beggars. We're not begging God. We know what God says and we're saying what he said. And it's doing this right here. This is why Jesus called John the, John the Baptist the greatest prophet who ever lived. Why? Because he was a bulldozer, bulldozing the way. And that's what we're to be doing in the spirit, right? So I, mean, I just wanted to paint that picture because that's what we're doing in prayer. It's not something that, oh, that's not, because I've said this before, that's not me. I'm not really a prayer. Well, that's baloney. I need to hop up in the bulldozer. If I know what God's will is, I need to get in the bulldozer and get to work, okay? And it's just opening my mouth and releasing God's word in the earth. Yeah. We're going to pray for just a couple of, a couple of moments here. And as we pray, I want you to be lifting up. We're going to call out names, okay? Call out names that we're, that we're believing God for. Uh, all right. Hallelujah. Now, I want to hear you pray. I don't want to be the only one praying. I'm going to get close to Beck. I can hear her. Thank, thank you, Lord. 
Hallelujah. Father, we worship you and we thank you for the greatness of your plan. We thank you that your will for all of mankind is that all men would be saved and come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For Jesus died for all. For Jesus took the sin of every man, every woman, and every boy and girl upon himself at the cross and shed his precious eternal blood that eternally removed from the north, as far as the east is from the west, all of our sin. Hallelujah. And so we thank you, Father. We're lifting up. We're lifting up loved ones before your throne right now. Father, you, 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 you spoke to Sister Jeannie Wilkerson that if we would be faithful to bring names of loved ones before your throne, that, that if you had to, you would wrestle them in the night to get their attention. Father, we believe that this is a time that the harvest is ripe that the harvest is ripe, that you've gone before by, by your Spirit to prepare hearts, uh, Father. And so we thank you for, for sending laborers um, in, in, into the harvest, Lord, sending laborers in uh, across our loved one's path with the good news of the gospel in their mouth. Uh, with the word of faith in their mouth. I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for the promise that whole families being swept in to the kingdom of God. And Father, as your people, we are committing to you that we are a people that's part of the laborers, that we will be faithful to be one that goes into the harvest, preaching Jesus, everyone, everywhere, every day. For truly, truly the harvest is so ripe. And so, Father, it is. It's ready. It's ready, it's ready, it's ready. We thank you and we celebrate the salvations uh, of this last week, Lord. We, we celebrate and we thank you and we praise you and we believe with all of our heart that it's the tip of the iceberg. That it's the tip of the iceberg. That whole families, if you're standing in here and you're believing for your family to be in church with you, this is a declaration. Whole families, my family swept into the kingdom. My family swept into the kingdom of God. And so I thank you for it, Father. I thank you for your faithfulness and I thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. That we would be a people. Um, that, that uh, runs our race with diligence. That, that we're not distracted by the things of the world, but we're living our lives with that eternal perspective, realizing that you are just about to come back for your church. And so, Father, that our hearts, that our hearts would be about empty in hell, Lord. Those that are on their way to hell, those that are on their way to hell, that, that they're going to have to crawl over us to get there. Oh, Father, I thank you. I, I thank you that you're doing a work in us and among us. I thank you for your eternal word, your eternal word, your eternal word, and that we would be a people that constantly have your word in our mouths uh, over, over our loved ones, over one another, over the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, for the greatness of your plan. For the greatness of your plan. Just like the Apostle Paul said, for the greatness of your plan, we bow our knee. We bow our knee. Oh, Father, our greatest days, the church's greatest days are ahead. Our path grows brighter and brighter. Father, I thank you for boldness. Just as our pastor said, the desire in his heart is that we would be a courageous church. A bold church that boldly proclaims the good news of the gospel. Hallelujah. Standing firm. Standing firm. Standing firm. Hallelujah. I thank you that your word keeps us uh, steady. That your word keeps us steady. Uh, immovable. Immovable by, uh, from the things that we see and from the things that we hear. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray in the Spirit for uh, about a minute. Thank you, Lord. 
Indo do basanda la bokunda la basi ki di ando lombo bada da da basi ki. Indo domba bamba da i sokondo o shanda i si i kanda o baba la kadashi kadaba. Elo boshi ki di anda la boda basi kada. Umbo da da lamba basi kanda la baba si ki di anda da 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 basondo da ba. Elo bosh kanda lamba banda la. And Father, we repent where there has been worry. We repent of worry. We re, re, repent of concern, Father. And so we thank you. We commit to you uh, that we lay that at your feet. And we will not worry. We will not worry. We will not be concerned. We will take the doubt and the unbelief off of our loved ones. And we will trust completely and wholly uh, in you. That you are a faithful God. Hallelujah. You're a faithful God. And you said that there is joy in believing. There's joy. <clears throat> and so joy will be an indication. Joy will be an indication as to whom we are believing. But God said that there is joy in believing. Glory to God. So, so we believe you, Lord, and we trust you. You are faithfully watching over your word to perform it. And we do thank you for whole families being swept in. Hallelujah. Whole families being swept in to the kingdom of God. Oh, we thank you for it. We thank you for it. You said that people would come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, for they know that in this place they will be blessed by the word and the spirit too, working mightily in and through you, through the body of Christ, through every person in here, the word and the spirit working mightily in and through you. Glory to God. Glory to God. We thank you, Father. We magnify you. We magnify you. Just lift your hands and let's just magnify them for just a moment. Father, we worship you. We give you praise and we give you glory for the greatness of your plan. Hallelujah. That our path grows brighter and brighter. That there is no diminishing in your kingdom. There is no diminishing, but only increase. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, Father, we thank you for Jesus that made a way where there was no way. And we apply the precious blood of Jesus over these families, over our extended families. And we thank you, Father, that the blood that saves us is the same blood that keeps us all of our days and all throughout of eternity. And everyone said, Amen. Good. All right. We love you guys. We'll see you Sunday. Who did?